When Field Marshal Douglas Haig was buried in his native Scotland in 1928, he was a national hero, revered by public and veterans alike. But that's not how most people remember him today. Field Marshal Haig has formulated a brilliant new tactical plan to ensure final victory in the field. Ah. Well, this brilliant plan involve us climbing out of our trenches and walking very slowly towards the enemy, sir? <laughs> How could you possibly know that, Blackadder? It's classified information. <laughs> it's the same plan that we used last time, and the 17 times before that. E e exactly! Egg was stubborn as a donkey. He was as unthinking as a donkey. He was as inarticulate as a donkey. So Haig, in fact, was the worst donkey on the British side of the war. The First World War is remembered for carnage, brave men sent to their deaths by incompetent officers. But new research by military historians into the performance of the British Army suggests this may not be the whole story, as these army cadets are discovering. You all know the popular myth about the British Army of the First World War, that it was a group of lions led by donkeys, and that Douglas Haig was a callous and incompetent butcher. The reality was rather different. Many modern historians, myself included, would argue that by 1917, the British Army was a very effective instrument of war. Haig was far from the idiot of popular myth, and the fact that his armies won the greatest series of victories in British military history mean we must take him seriously as a commander. Douglas Haig's ideas on fighting campaigns were forged during his years as a cavalry officer in the Sudan and South Africa. They were reinforced here at British Army Staff College, where unlike most of his colleagues, Haig took his studies seriously. But he did come from the same background as his fellow officers. Haig was wealthy and upper class. At Staff College, Haig was taught not to shrink from the attack. Battles were planned and executed in set stages. After the enemy had been worn down, the cavalry was to break through their defensive line in the final sweep to decisive victory. But war had changed. The First World War is the first war in modern history, the first war in any history in which two great industrial powers are pitted against each other. And modern industry can produce killing weapons in prodigious numbers. Weapons like the machine gun, the magazine-fed rifle, artillery using axial recoil, which means you could fire shells very rapidly. If you look at the introduction of barbed wire as stopping forces on the attack, the whole balance in warfare has moved away from the advantage being with the attacker to the advantage being with the defender. But this harsh military reality was not grasped in 1914 when patriotism swept the nations of Europe. All believed in a speedy outcome. When we joined up the army, it was generally thought that the war would last six months and no longer. That was a common thought. It was in the media as well and everyone said, oh, you'll be back in six months. One of the great problems that all the politicians in all the countries faced was to tell their electorates that the war 
would not go on and on and on forever, that it was with a foreseeable end in sight. And the generals, therefore, equally had an obligation to bring that about. The main focus of fighting was on the Western Front once the German army had swept through Belgium and northern France. In 1915, Britain's allies begged her government to intervene, and the task was entrusted to the commander-in-chief of the regular British army, Sir John French. He turned to his subordinate, General Douglas Haig. The location selected by Haig was the tiny German-held village of Neuve-Chapelle. Of little importance strategically, capturing it would prove to the French that the British were taking their obligations seriously. By the spring of 1915, Neuve-Chapelle, like the rest of the Western Front, had been fortified. The Germans had dug a defensive line of trenches with strong points and barbed wire. The problem would be how to get British infantry soldiers across no man's land and into the German trenches. Haig and his subordinates had a plan. They saw that the way to proceed was to gather up all the artillery and all the shells that they could employ and to use them on a length of front that was appropriate to that amount of shelling. Once British shells had destroyed the German barbed wire and machine guns, the infantry would cross no man's land and take the German trenches and the village. The cavalry would then exploit the break in the German line, pushing out into open country. The British bombardment took the Germans by surprise, but the artillery was inaccurate and the enemy defences were not neutralised. The British infantry succeeded in taking the village that morning, but there was no chance of a cavalry breakthrough. The Germans brought in reserves at the last minute to set up another line of defence further back. By the end of the three-day battle, important lessons had been learned by both sides. The Germans needed more trenches and deeper defences. And Haig, having seen the power of the artillery, believed he needed more guns, more shells, more men and a wider front for the next big offensive. He drew the conclusion that more could have been accomplished and that therefore what they had to do was to do Neuve Chapelle better in order that they could actually achieve a breakthrough. By the time the opportunity came for a big offensive, Haig had taken Sir John French's place as British Commander-in-Chief on the Western Front. The strengths and weaknesses of his character would affect the running of the war and seal the fate of his army, now numbering almost a million men. The general headquarters for this rapidly expanding army was in the small provincial town of Montreux. Haig himself lived and worked in nearby Chateau Beaurepaire, 40 miles behind the front line. On taking command in December 1915, he confided to his wife, My darling Doris, all seem to expect success as the result of my arrival, and somehow give me the idea that they think I am meant to win by some superior power. While doing my utmost, I feel one's best can go but a short way without help from above. Your loving husband, Douglas. He saw himself as the instrument of God. And again he said this, that God Almighty would see him through his various battles. Well, God Almighty had no more knowledge of what was going on on the Western Front than Haig did. And to rely on God Almighty really was a, a pretty false read at that time. And for Haig to say that God was at his right shoulder or his right arm and helping him, well, uh, that's a form of blasphemy. The very fact that he is commander of the British Army and the British nation being God's nation means that he has been selected by God to lead the British Army to victory. This is the way he sees his position and part of that belief in authority is to be remote from those you command. And if you look at it from the point of view of the people he commands, the men admire an officer probably much more if he has an air of superiority and distance about him. Oh, he looked very smart and well, yes. I was. I was a good-looking chap. 
He looks every inch a soldier, every inch a commander. He looks a capable man, you know. He didn't ever go up to the front line. He didn't go up to the trenches and dirty his boots. Hayek had no con comprehension of what he was sending men into. A great commander knows exactly what he's sending his men into, as later commanders, such as Field Marshal Montgomery did. But Hay didn't. And this was partly because of the extraordinary way in which he lived at montreuil sur mer where he had his headquarters. There was absolutely no purpose in the commander being close to the front. He couldn't see a thing. He would be seeing only a few inches, in effect, of the total picture. He had to be somewhere where he could see as much of the total picture as he could. In other words, he had to be at a communication centre where information from over this huge front um, was coming into him. Haig's remoteness from the day-to-day -day life of the front was partly inspired by his own notions of the role of a commander, as recorded in his staff college notebook some 20 years earlier. In order to command, it is necessary to foresee the chief duty of the higher command is to prepare for battle, not to execute it on the battlefield, after having clearly indicated to subordinate leaders their respective missions. We must leave the execution to them. That sounds like a, an almost perfect recipe for the command style of modern armies, uh, whereby you give somebody a mission and you leave them to work out the details how to achieve that mission. But we have a problem with Douglas Haig. He is not good at orally communicating. So you, in some respects, have got the worst of all situations with Haig's planning. He has a general plan. Uh, it is his intention to stand back and not get involved in the details. Yet he does interfere. Uh, his subordinate commanders are frightened of him. And yet frequently, when he has identified things that they are doing wrong, he stands back. Uh, and doesn't try and correct them. Now, that strikes me as being a, a recipe for um, military disaster. Douglas Haig is the commander whose battle plans are blamed for mass slaughter. You look surprised, Baggett. I certainly am, sir. I didn't realize we had any battle plans. <laughs> Do you think the battles are directed? Our battles are directed, sir. <laughs> well, of course they are, Black Adder, directed according to the grand plan. Would that be the plan to continue with total slaughter until everyone's dead except Field Marshal Haig, Lady Haig, and their tortoise, Alum? <laughs> the principle which guided him that if he could kill more German than the German could kill his men, then he would inevitably, at some time, win. Now, that is, is an appalling kind of strategy. It's not a strategy at all. It's just slaughter. Haig did not launch his campaigns simply in order to kill Germans or to get his own men killed. He always had great visions for what his operations were going to achieve. There was nothing wrong about Haig launching a big campaign. What was wrong was Haig dreaming that he could accomplish such huge objectives. In 1916, here on the River Somme, Haig planned a great offensive, in part to relieve pressure on the French army, suffering horrendous losses at Verdun. Chosen for political, not strategic reasons, this was the point on the Western Front where the British and French armies met. Just as in the planning for Neuve Chapelle, Haig intended a classic cavalry breakthrough after the infantry had captured the enemy trenches but everything depended on the artillery. The whole concept of the 1st of July 1916 was going to be that nothing would have survived the barrage, the bombardment, and that when the barrage lifted, the infantry would walk over and occupy the shattered trenches and then move on again. Shells were coming all day long and all night long. Well, yes, it, it was that. It was a real bombardment. Yes, yes, the gunfire would tell him. We knew something was happening all right. On the eve of the battle, Haig's confidence was high. 
With God's help, I feel hopeful. The men are in splendid spirits. Several have said that they have never before been so instructed and informed of the nature of the operation before them. The wire has never been so well cut, nor the artillery preparation so thorough. A week before the battle, they, they blew all this wire wire and cleared the ground for, for, the, for the men to go over the top. But unfortunately, they didn't clear sufficient. When they came to go over the top, a lot of the uh, wire was still uh, uh, in position. At 7.20 a.m., several huge mines signaled the beginning of the attack. We climbed up the fire step and went forward. Well, no one told us it was going to be an onslaught. Well, you just going up over the top and you went forward. You, you listened to the guns going and your friends next door to you. But this chap on my right, I was talking to him one minute, the next minute he wasn't there. He was somewhere behind what's left of him. But uh, you, you just had to go through, through the, through the barbed wire if you could get it through. If your kilt caught on it, well, you just left your kilt on it and went straight forward without your kilt. But hell let loose it from both sides. Yeah, the Battle of the Somme. There were nearly 60,000 British casualties that day. 20,000 of them killed. Well, um, on the evening of the 1st of July, I went up onto the, what was the battlefield, and you couldn't walk on grass. There were all dead bodies everywhere. And so the uh, infantry came along and, and dug uh, big uh, holes, say, 100 bodies. Haig should not have been attacking on as wide a front as he was, and he should not have been attacking to the depth that he was. Um, he insisted on doubling the depth which his second in command, Rawlinson, had proposed, which meant halving the intensity of the artillery bombardment. As a result, the artillery bombardment that he fired, which was supposed totally to destroy the enemy defences, in fact, hardly dented them. British gains along the front varied, depending on the effectiveness of the bombardment. On the southern part of the battlefront, British soldiers were able to advance one mile and take the German-held village of Montauban. This was their greatest success. Nine miles to the north, opposite the village of beaumont hamel British soldiers suffered heavy casualties without gaining a single yard. Haig was determined the battle should continue despite politicians' concerns. He informed London on the 1st of August that he intended to maintain the offensive. The Battle of the Somme lasted for a total of 142 days. Haig's decision to go on with the Battle of the Somme to the 18th of November, with each day getting worse and worse, was criminal negligence because there was no possibility of any kind of gain. Now, that was negligent. The criminality came in knowing that each day he was losing more and more men who were trying to do the impossible, the absolute impossible. One of the big criticisms that is made of Haig is that he should have stopped the offensive at a certain date. Was obviously, he was not going to achieve a breakthrough, and we were suffering as many casualties as the Germans. One of the reasons why Haig doesn't do this is because the intelligence picture he is getting is that the Germans are being worn down, and one more push and you're going to break the German army. Haig's belief in a German collapse was fostered by his head of intelligence, John Charters. Charters tended to put the view that the glass was half empty rather than the glass was half full, as his appreciation, he put it forward. He was also highly conscious that Douglas Haig was bearing an immense burden. And he tried to lighten that burden by putting a little bit of an additional spin on the information he gave. And the result was that continually Douglas Haig was coming through with an opinion that the Germans were actually nearer collapse than they were. Charters begins to interpret his role as not to find out what is actually going on with the German army and how to win 
the war, but rather to show, to provide Haig with the evidence that the war is in fact being won. The result of that being, of course, uh, that there is no reason then to change what you are doing. During the four months of the campaign, the Germans suffered such losses that their commanders decided to withdraw to new lines of defense up to 20 miles back. And despite heavy casualties, the British Army gained some hard experience. In many ways, the Somme was the most important campaign the British fought in the First World War. This was the battle which turned the British Army from being a group of amateurs into a fairly hard-bitten and very effective army. No one can visit the Somme battlefield without being impressed with the magnitude of the effort made by the British Army so that credit for pluck and resolution has been earned by men from every part of the empire. Although new to this terrible game of war, they were able, time and again, to form up their commands in the darkness of night, and in spite of shell holes, wire, and other obstacles, lead them forward in the gray of the morning to attack these tremendous positions. To many, it meant certain death. And all must have known that before they started. He once said, there is nothing more difficult than to go on planning, knowing that whatever you plan is going to cause men to die. But it had to be done. And he was prepared for it, and he was prepared to take the punishment and bear the strain of it. Because after all, the buck stopped with him, and he was prepared to take it. You've only got to look at Douglas Haig to see the immense resilience and endurance of the man, and this is what his troops knew. Well, I thought he was a good commander. If it wasn't, if he hadn't sent him over, what would have happened? What would happen? The war would have gone on and on and on and on. It was a war of attrition who could stand it the longest. I wouldn't like the responsibility of sending people to their death. I wouldn't like that. No. No, I certainly wouldn't ask anybody to do a job where they're going to get killed. I wouldn't like to do it myself. But he, if someone had to do it, to accept the responsibility. Within Haig's religious beliefs, there is the idea of sacrifice for a Christian cause. Now, if you believe devotedly in that idea, as Haig does, then the, the men who die, in a sense, uh, are being rewarded because sac the sacrifice is the reward. So to fall on the battlefield, in Haig's view, is not a tragedy. I attended the Church of Scotland service. The Reverend G. Duncan conducted and preached a good sermon. We lament too much over death, he said. We should regard it as a welcome change to another room. The great danger with Haig's religion is his assumption that his men have the same devout religious beliefs, and therefore that his men are going to death as comfortable with this sacrifice as Haig himself is. Haig's view on death was a very, very simple one, that there were going to be enormous losses in fighting the German army. The British had to take the whole brunt on themselves. He was quite conscious of this weight, and he knew what it meant in terms of casualties. If you are content to believe that heavy casualties are inevitable, they will indeed be inevitable. This became a fixation so that Haig and others fully expected that no matter what they did, no matter what tactics they pursued, there would be heavy casualties among our own men. This fixation was to me uh, not only stupid, but, but criminal, in that no other alternative was conceived. This is the only time in history that Britain has had an army of that size which met the main enemy in the main theater of operations. The simple fact is, 
fighting that sort of warfare, casualties are bound to be heavy. When you look at casualty rates in the Second World War, at least in the 1944-45 campaign, the, the campaign from Normandy to the Baltic, casualty rates equaled or exceeded those on the Western Front. There is no evidence that British losses in the First World War were disproportionately higher than those of our allies, the French, or indeed of our enemies, the Germans. In the popular mind, casualties still remain the dominant feature of the Great War. Haig had accepted that casualties would be high when he was planning the Somme campaign, and a memo to the press had been issued in advance of the battle. Together with patience, the nation must be taught to bear losses. No amount of skill on the part of the higher commanders. No superiority, however great, of arms and ammunition will enable victories to be won without the sacrifice of men's lives. To sum up, the lessons which the people of England have to learn are patience, self-sacrifice and confidence in our ability to win in the long run. Eighty years ago, the British public was bearing the losses with stoicism, but British politicians weren't. In particular, David Lloyd George, the new Prime Minister. It's often said Lloyd George was very concerned about casualties. Lloyd George only once went to visit a wounded man. He was the son of a politician who asked him to go and see his son. Lloyd George came away from that saying, I should never have been asked to go and see that man. I am too sensitive to witness such a scene. I cannot continue with my job if I have to see people in that condition. Lloyd George, it needs to be remembered, was the person who gave Haig all those soldiers and all those guns with which to get on and fight the war. As the new year dawned, these two powerful men were completely at odds. The radical Welsh politician cast himself as the people's champion. The wealthy commander was backed by the king and his friends. Each was convinced that his formula for winning the war was the right one. To Haig's consternation, Lloyd George believed that victory could be bought more cheaply by fighting Germany's allies in Turkey, in the Balkans, or on the Italian front. The thing you notice about Lloyd George's preferred campaigns is either they were totally harebrained, like the idea of a campaign in the Balkans, or they had very little relevance with the war against Germany. They may have been fine in a war against Turkey, but we weren't fighting Turkey primarily. We had to win the war by defeating the Germans. Um, the other thing you notice about Lloyd George is that he is always talking about big campaigns producing big successes. And this is something he has in common with the Douglas Haig, though they are loath to recognize the fact that they are both men who think big. They are both men who want to achieve great purposes. Lloyd George is the Prime Minister. He has to look at the war from a wide perspective, the political, economic and the military. And Douglas Haig and the military frequently forget that they are but one part of the war effort. I mean, a, a crucial part of the war effort, but they are but one part of the war effort. The politicians are going to have a say. They have a, a constitutional right to have a say. Although he couldn't get rid of Haig, Lloyd George set in motion a scheme to seriously limit his power. Having done a secret deal with the new French commander, Robert Nivelle, Lloyd George set up a conference in February 1917. Haig arrived to find that the Prime Minister had arranged for the British Army, including Haig, to come under the direct control of the French. The aftermath of the Calais Conference probably reveals Haig at his most dignified. Uh, he has, after all, uh, suffered probably the, most, the worst indignity that a British commander-in-chief um, can suffer, being betrayed by your prime minister and being placed under the command of a foreign general. That evening, Haig complained in his diary it is too sad at this critical time to have to fight with one's allies and the home government in addition to the enemy in the field. 
Nivelle's much heralded spring offensive, supported by Lloyd George, failed to break through and brought the French army to the verge of mutiny. But British and Canadian forces scored a notable success at Arras. His position weakened, Lloyd George reluctantly agreed to Haig's own plan in Flanders, the Third Battle of Ypres, known as Passchendaele. The quiet Belgian town of Ypres was at the center of the most hellish section of the British front. For almost four years, it was shelled by the Germans. Ypres was obliterated. Haig had played a major part in saving the town from German occupation at the beginning of the war. Haig is haunted by his experiences at the first Battle of Ypres back in 1914. That was the destruction of the old regular army, and Haig experienced then just how close the Germans came to breaking through. And I think psychologically that meant that Ypres and the area of Flanders held a, a special place in his operational thinking. Haig's objective was to capture the Germans' immediate high ground and break through their lines to seize an important railway junction at Rouleur and the channel ports beyond. A major advance at Ypres could win the war. At Messine Ridge in June, a well-planned and executed attack preceded the main Ypres offensive. Nineteen colossal mines literally blew the German front line to pieces. We're standing in Passchendaele New British Cemetery, just about at the tip of the British advance in the Ypres salient in 1917. The Third Battle of Ypres, or Passchendaele, is probably the most controversial battle that Douglas Haig ever fought. By the time of Passchendaele, Haig's army was a much more flexible force than it had been only 12 months earlier, and Haig himself had learned many lessons. Haig understood the nature of warfare on the Western Front. He understood that it would be a long drawn out attritional struggle to wear down the German army. But he never lost sight of the idea that ultimately attrition must end and mobile warfare must begin again. The campaign depended, as Haig knew, on the bombardment. More than four million shells were fired in two weeks. Then, after weeks of sunshine, heavy rains began on the first day of the battle. The battlefield quickly became a quagmire. The attack bogged down immediately. It was an impossible situation. We lost several men in shell holes because they, they just fell in and they were then full of mud and water, you know. And we lost several men that way. Some of the chaps had about 120 pounds on their backs, and if he fell at the side, if he sucked in, they couldn't pull him out because there was all the stuff on him. They had ropes and every time, but it's a great really sunk down. These chaps say, Oh, for goodness sake, shoot me, shoot me, shoot me. And eventually, they, they were just, uh, just sunk in the mud, they weren't seen again. We were going through where about 50 men had been caught under heavy shell fire. They were absolutely uh, wiped out. It's the first time, it's the only th time I've felt, I've smelt um, human blood. And it's a most horrible smell. It's a filthy smell. But these men had only just been killed. And we had to more or less just go wade through them, as you might say, to get on because you, uh, you didn't dally on a thing like that. Just as at the Somme, Haig's intelligence reported that the German army was on the verge of collapse and he refused to call off the campaign. A series of quick blows almost broke the enemy line, but the German army held out. The village of Passchendaele, originally a first phase objective, was finally taken three months later on November the 6th. Was the Third Battle of Ypres worth it? We know that it, it was an appalling battle for the Germans. We can say that the British learnt a lot about the operational art of war. But I think in terms of Douglas Haig, 
you have to say that it was a failure. Um, he didn't achieve what, he, what he, his aim was, which was a breakout. But I think that he used up the last remaining bits of credibility he had in London, not just with Lloyd George and the politicians, but with many of his military peer group. Lloyd George didn't sack Haig. He couldn't find anyone else suitable for the job, and Haig still had powerful friends. But only two weeks after the close of the Passchendaele campaign, at the Battle of Combray, technology promised to break the stalemate. Haig's attitude to technology was virtually nil. He didn't understand technology. The horse was always what mattered to him. And he kept large squadrons of cavalry behind the, the British lines, ready for the push-through, the breakthrough, which he always expected was going to come. One of the myths that surrounds Sir Douglas Haig is that because he was so fond of the cavalry, he must have been simply an old fuddy-duddy, always looking backward, always resistant to innovation and to new weapons. Now, this is quite untrue. Haig would welcome any weapon that he thought would advance his cause. From the beginning, Douglas Haig was enthusiastic about tanks. He ordered a hundred within days of the first prototype being tested in January 1916, and he used them on the Somme that autumn. But he didn't believe that the tank was the wonder weapon that could win the war. Now, the problem of the tank is, of course, that the machine gun bullet may bounce off, though in time it won't, but the high explosive shell won't bounce off. So the tank is not going to be an effective weapon until, first of all, your artillery has learned the way of suppressing the enemy's artillery in order that the tank can get forward without being turned into a blazing wreck on the battlefield. The real instance of military obtuseness in the use of the tank is not the British command at all, it's the German command. Why didn't these supposedly far-sighted German commanders pick up on the tank as an important new weapon of war? German commanders put their faith not in technology, but in stormtrooper tactics when they launched a massive offensive across a 60-mile front. They attacked on the 21st of March, 1918, at 6 o'clock. There was a mess, so that helped them, because they were able to, to infiltrate without being seen, as you might say. Haig and his staff were looking forward to a German offensive. They expected a German offensive because they believed that the, the British Army was uh, well prepared, that it had learnt a lot of lessons, and that the Germans would attack and would be uh, badly chewed up by those British defences to the extent that Haig uh, seriously believed that this would then enable him to go on to the offensive. Within 10 days, the Germans had forced the British back 40 miles. It was the most dramatic movement on the Western Front in over three years. Oh, but we're getting pushed back. And it, and it did push us back so far, you see. And that's when Aegis disorder that every man had to stand his ground. Couldn't do anything else, really. It's either that or let them win. Many amongst us are now tired. To those, I would say, that victory belongs to those who hold out the longest. There is no other course open to us but to fight it out. Every position must be held to the last man. There must be no retirement. With our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, each one of us must fight on to the end. He never doubted himself and he never doubted the British Army. He had the determination to see things through, and when other people started buckling at the knees, he held them up. For four months, it appeared that the German commander, Ludendorff, was achieving what Haig could not, a dramatic offensive victory. Ludendorff produces striking success. He gets his army forward 40 miles, and by the time it's advanced 40 miles, it has outrun its artillery and it is naked to its enemies and it is suffering prohibitive casualties. 
During that period, the German army suffered almost one million dead and wounded, more than double the number of casualties suffered by the British during the Somme campaign in 1916. Ludendorff had not learned what was slowly dawning on Sir Douglas Haig and had become the general pattern throughout the British army. Once you'd gone as far as the artillery could protect you, don't try and get any further. Then you stopped, then you brought up your artillery, then you did it all again. You made a series of small steps. New research by historians shows how by the final months of the war, the British Army had become phenomenally effective in its use and understanding of artillery. Not just more effective than the Germans, but more effective than its own allies. And the artillery, of course, undergoes great development under Haig's leadership. He's doing what a good commander should do, allowing his experts to get on with the job of being expert, of employing the weaponry, of developing the weaponry, and making it possible for them to bring those weapons to the battlefield where they are needed for the appropriate moment. By mid-1918, you have a flexible battle, a flexible artillery battle, a flexible artillery battle married in with other arms, including the Royal Flying Corps Royal Air Force, so that you have the beginnings of the kind of battle that you saw in the Second World War, with communication all working together. And in 1918, you get an artillery, infantry, tanks and aircraft attack, which the Germans cannot deal with and cannot answer. From his mobile train headquarters, Haig set his sights on the greatest obstacle on the Western Front, the legendary system of German defences known as the Hindenburg Line. Making full use of canals and high ground wherever possible, the Germans had built the line after the Battle of the Somme in the winter of 1916. Up to 10 miles deep, the system of defences was considered impregnable. Oh, it's very strongly fortified with barbed wire and, uh, and trenches and everything. And they don't want a trench and another trench with barbed wire. It's very, very strong. I don't think the Germans ever thought that we'd break through. But by that time, we, they, they, we had uh, a tremendous amount of guns, gunfire and everything else. It always breaks through quite easily, really. As far as I was concerned. It's quite easy. We just followed the barrage and we were over and, uh, and we did, never got any fire or anything. It's amazing. The new form of integrated attacks with limited objectives brought a startling victory. Within 10 days, Haig's armies had broken through the various lines of the Hindenburg defenses into the open fields beyond. On October 15th, Haig came to savour victory at the San Quentin Canal, the old German front line. And the breakthrough of the Hindenburg line, that was a big breakthrough. And we broke through there. That was the beginning to the end. Morale was high, yes, yes, really. I think we could see we were going to win. What we are seeing in 1918 is a decisive battlefield victory, because Haig has given up the notion of his great sweeping vaults, and therefore is being obliged to fight the sort of battle that the British Army can fight and can win. Now, I know that the reluctance to take this view on board is so entrenched because people are so obsessed with Haig and his failings that they cannot believe that an army under such command could do well. What has become a pinky dinky fall? On the 11th of November, 1918, the war ended. Maybe she still is true to you and true to the rest of the army too. Dinky, dinky, parlez-vous. He didn't win. He was there at the finish. He was the only general from 1916 who was still there in 1918 because all the others had gone by natural wastage or because they'd been removed, and in most cases, very fittingly removed. He was the only one still there. After the war, Haig was received as a hero. And a lot of people who defend him say, well, yes, look, 
The people loved him. Look at the way he was lauded back in Britain. The British public would have cheered Charlie Chaplin if Charlie Chaplin had been in command of the army. They were not cheering Haig. They were cheering the end of the war. They were cheering their release from this appalling abyss into which the country had fallen on the Western Front. This was an extremely horrible war with massive losses, and therefore a war which required a commander who could withstand those losses. A commander with the stubbornness and the determination, and perhaps even the insensitivity to not be affected by the losses. Douglas Haig's fate was to lead the British Army at a time when industrial power brought killing on a scale hitherto unimagined. That same technology brought Haig victory, but at the cost of 723,000 British dead and more than one and a half million wounded. Again and again, people have used him as a scapegoat, as a lightning conductor, because of people's concentration on one thing, casualties. It has been this, this folk memory which has darkened Haig's reputation down the years and still darkens it today, and possibly will for another 50 years. I believe eventually Haig will be seen more clearly and more fairly than he is today, but certainly it's gone on far longer than one would have dreamt possible. There's a new series of Time Watch beginning on BBC Two this autumn.